everyone and welcome to the second workshop in the crafting character series. My name is Betsy Huggins and I'm the Director of Education and Community Engagement at Alabama Shakespeare Festival. Today we're going to take the character that you created in the last workshop and put it on the page. So think back to that last workshop. You created a character through movement using the physicality of leading with different parts of your body to create a character. Next, you participated in a narrative pantomime where you lived the life of your character for a day. You thought about where they live, what they do, who they might associate with in a given day, and how they feel about themselves and the world around them. And finally, you did a prop activity where you found something that your character might own or might discover and thought about the ways that your character might have come into possession of the object. Today we're going to take all of those ideas and get them on the page as we work towards writing an original monologue. If you didn't attend the first workshop, no worries. You can create an original character today based on some questions I'll give you. So our goal today, in addition to crafting our character, is to learn more about ourselves as a writer. Who are you as a writer? What do you enjoy writing about? Uh, and where do you think that can take you? On your journey of playwriting. Uh, we're also going to read two example monologues, uh, especially for our, the folks out there who might not be as familiar with theater. We'll look at two of those today to get a sense of what's possible with this craft. What's up next is next Thursday. That's April 23rd if you're following along with us live. Uh, we are going to actually write our monologue on that day. We'll take a lot of the ideas that we'll brainstorm today. We'll write our monologue and we'll also look at some more advanced playwriting questions and also a revision process that might work for you where you are at home. So during the workshop, you'll have the opportunity to pause whenever you want to to write. So instead of staring at me while you're writing, pause the video and as soon as you're ready to get back into it, just click play. The video will continue and you'll jump back into the workshop. Feel free to write in clips and phrases, in words and ideas, or full sentences. Write however works for you. And you can even split this up into multiple writing sessions. As writers, we're discovering our identity. Some of us like to really sit down, hunker down, and focus. Some of us are uh, have a, a little bit more distraction in our lives. So do what works best for you. I made a worksheet for today's lesson. It's linked uh, right next to this video. In it, you've got all the questions we're gonna review in our workshop, along with our example monologues. Feel free to follow on along with the worksheet if you have that capability, but if not, no worries. All you'll need is a blank piece of paper and a pen, and you can do the same thing that anybody with a workshop worksheet is doing. So to begin today, get out that pen and paper, and we're gonna start with a brief writing warm-up. I'll ask you a series of questions and you'll respond to them on the page. Let's get started. First question, what is a playwright? I want you to write down your definition of a playwright, along with any words or images or phrases that come to mind when you consider what is a playwright. All right, welcome back. Hopefully that first prompt wasn't that hard. While I can't check in on your writing and I can't read it, I can't hear it, I can share my own work. And while your work might be very different from my work, trust me, there's no wrong answers today. So here's what I said. The definition of playwright for me is someone who writes a story for the stage. Other words and ideas that come to mind when I think of a playwright is an artist, an inventor, a world builder, a storyteller. I also thought a lot about plays that I've seen or I've been in, plays that have really stuck with me, uh, and different moments in my life where, where theater has touched me, that have led me to this path of playwriting. All right, next prompt. What plays and playwrights do you enjoy? So like, think back on uh, your life. Any plays that stick out to you, any playwrights that stick out to you. Um, for those of you who are maybe new to theater and playwriting, consider what kinds of authors, stories, and genres you like. 
For example, maybe you're really into history and you love reading historical fiction, stories that are set in another time. Maybe you really like science fiction, fantasy. Maybe you're really into realism and you love gritty family dramas. But start thinking, what are some stories that you find yourself drawn to? When you turn on Netflix or a movie, what are you more likely to watch? A comedy? An action adventure? A western? What are you drawn to? Write that down on the page. In as long or as short a form as you'd like it, jot down what kind of stories do you enjoy? Great. So, uh, as you begin to understand your identity as a writer, it's really important to think about what kinds of stories you're already attracted to. Just like an athlete might have a particular sport that they're really inclined to play, writers tend to develop what we call a voice or a specific style that might include types of characters we write, genres or styles we write in, subjects that we're really interested in exploring, whether that's a period piece, contemporary plays, futuristic work. Some playwrights even develop a really clear way that their characters tend to speak. Knowing what you like already is a really helpful way to start thinking about what you might enjoy writing about. And the world needs all kinds of writers. We need people to write fantasy. We need people to write historic plays, romances. We need everyone. So stay true to your inspiration and your impulses as a writer. So we're here to our last fi final writing prompt before we get started for today. Again, we're just using this muscle. Writing is a muscle just like any other muscle. You gotta use it or you'll lose it. So we're just warming up for today with this last question. I want you to think about a time that you've eavesdropped on someone. We all know it's not polite. We all know that it's kind of a forbidden thing to do, but we do it anyways. Think about what kinds of conversations you've eavesdropped on. Maybe your parents, your friends, a teacher. Who do you like to eavesdrop on? And what kinds of stories are you hoping to hear? Put that on the page. Maybe a memorable time that you eavesdropped on someone or just one kinds of conversations you like to listen in on. All right, I bet you wrote some incredible ideas about the kinds of stories you like to eavesdrop on. Most of the conversations we like to eavesdrop on include reveal of new information. Learning something new or shocking or scandalous is the reason we eavesdrop in the first place. We don't tend to eavesdrop on people and conversations that we're already like 100% I get it, I get you. We tend to listen in on things that are like, did you hear about Becky? Or this is what the test is going to look like in a week. We tend to listen in for new information. To put it another way, would you rather listen in on a juicy piece of gossip or someone talking about the weather? Probably the juicy gossip because you already know the weather because you've looked outside. All right, so we're moving into the rest of our writing workshop today. Keep these ideas in your back pocket. So consider what kinds of stories you're interested in, how you personally define a playwright, and what kinds of conversations you find most interesting. All of those things are gonna help us when we finally craft our monologue. So today we're gonna to jump back into our character that we created. So either pull out more paper or continue on the sheet that you're using. I'm gonna lead you through some questions to further define your character. So again, feel free to pause and as you write, you can always chime back when, in when you're ready. If a question stumps you or you're confused, feel free to move on. There's no right answers today. So first things first, what's your character's name? Name your character. Give them a first name and a last name if they have one. How old is this character? Are they young? Are they middle-aged? Are they ancient? Are we living in the future where humans live to be 300 years old? Give your character an age. I'm 
Next up, give your character some personality traits. Think about how family members, friends, co-workers, teachers, how would they describe this character? Are they kind or are they mean? Are they smart or are they dull? Try and come up with a mix of positive characteristics, like kind, smart, courageous, and negative characteristics, like bossy, a liar. Think about how a person is. We're not all good all the time. We all have negative character traits. So make sure your character is well-rounded. Next, describe some important relationships in your character's life. You might even reflect back on your narrative pantomime exercise from the first class. Who do they live with? Who do they encounter in, a, in an everyday situation? Who's really important to them? Next, what's their job or role? So while adults have jobs, or most adults have jobs, kids are students. How does your character occupy their day? Do they get up and go to work? Do they go to school? Are they a baby and they roll around in their crib all day? How do they occupy their time? And how do they feel about it? Are they good at their job? Are they bad at it? Do they have a hobby they enjoy? Are they good at that hobby? I know a lot of guitar players who are very bad. So consider what does your character do all day for work and for play? And finally, I want you to write down what they want right now in this moment. It could be something really tangible, like a new phone, or it could be something a bit larger. They want a better job a date to the prom, for their best friend to forgive them. Write down your character's goal. What do they want? Hopefully you've created a pretty good sketch of your character, who they are, what they do, who they interact with, and most importantly, what they want. If you'd like to continue on character exploration, feel free to pause the video and continue to answer questions about your character to further hone and define them. Otherwise, we're gonna keep going. I'm gonna introduce you into one of my key rules about writing. You're not married to anything you write, meaning that if something that you write doesn't work for you later on, you can always change it. You can go back and revise and edit. If you've created something that doesn't help your eventual monologue, feel free to start over. You're always able to change your mind. So let's talk about what we're working towards. We're working towards writing a monologue. What is a monologue, you might ask? So here's a, a longer definition of a monologue. A monologue is one character speaking uninterrupted for an extended period of times. My like bare minimum for a monologue is five sentences, but when we think about a monologue that we're going to perform, you should be shooting for somewhere between 15 and 30 sentences for a monologue that could be performed at around a minute in time. A monologue is always spoken in the first person using words like I, me, my, myself. This monologue can be directed to another character a group of characters. It can be directed uh, to themselves, which we call a soliloquy, or it can be directed uh, towards the audience, which we call an aside. So after hearing the above definition of a monologue, you might be thinking, okay, so that sounds like a speech. Here's the big difference between a monologue and a speech. I'm gonna give you two examples. So first off, imagine a student is giving a speech in a classroom. That might be a place where you've typically seen people giving speeches. So their teacher has assigned them this exercise and has given them a topic to speak on that they're just not interested in. They're not horribly shy, but they're also not engaged in the speech. And they really don't care if they pass or fail the assignment. That is not a monologue. Yes, it's one character speaking for an extended period of time, in this case towards a group of characters, 
But if the character doesn't really care about what's happening, that's not a monologue. Here's my second example. Imagine a different student. It's the same class, but they've been allowed to pick their assignment. And they're talking about a topic that they are super passionate about. It is their goal in this monologue to get everybody to support a cause that they really care about. Now consider that they are not just shy, but painfully shy. They're gonna have to overcome so many internal obstacles just to open up their mouth and speak. And finally, let's add some more pressure on to, to them. Let's say that they're failing class. And if they do not get an A on this speech, they're gonna fail the class. And that's gonna ruin everything. Could prevent them even from graduating high school. We can raise the circumstances that are on this character until just a simple speech becomes a monologue. So let's break these concepts down. So first off, monologues require characters to be in a high state of emotion. They're excited, they're scared, they're nervous, they're hopeful. Otherwise, why are they talking so much? We call it in monologue writing a need to tell. What is compel compelling this character to speak now? Monologues also require characters to have strong wants or goals, something to work towards. They also require characters to have obstacles that are standing in their way. If my monologue is about wanting a new iPhone and I say, I would like a new iPhone, and the other character says, here, monologue's over. But if I'm trying to get an iPhone out of my mom, Ooh, that's gonna be really hard because she does not wanna get me one. So I'm gonna have to try multiple ways to persuade her to get what I want. So now we're gonna read some example monologues to see if we can determine the need to tell, what the character wants, and what's standing in their way. So after each example monologue that we read, we're gonna pull out our paper and respond to the following questions. Number one, what is the need to tell? What is inspiring this character to speak right now? Number two, what does the character want and who are they speaking to? Let's try and define the audience for this monologue. And finally, what's standing in the character's way? What obstacles are they trying to overcome to get what they want? You can record your responses on paper. So our example monologues today are gonna to come from a musical called You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. Some of you might be familiar with this play. Uh, you might have even been in this musical, uh, but you might also just be familiar with the Peanuts characters. We're talking Charlie Brown, Snoopy, that kind of thing. Uh, what I like about these monologues is that regardless of your familiarity with the Peanuts characters in that whole world, you get a real sense of who these characters are through the monologues just from how they're speaking. So I'm not going to be performing them. I'm just going to read them for you um, to get a sense of, of how a monologue is structured. And again, we're listening for need to tell what they want and what obstacles stand in their way. So this first monologue is from Sally. She's the younger sister of Charlie Brown, and she's just received some bad news from her teacher. A C? A C? I got a C on my coat hanger sculpture? How would anyone get a C in coat hanger sculpture? May I ask a question? Was I judged on the piece of sculpture itself? If so, is it not true that time alone can judge a work of art? Or was I judged by my talent? If so, is it that fair that I be judged on a part of my life on which I have no control? If I was judged on my effort, then I was judged unfairly, for I tried as hard as I could. Was I judged on what I had learned about this project? If so, then were not you? My teacher, also being judged on your ability to transmit knowledge to me, are you willing to share my C? Perhaps I was being judged on the quality of the coat hanger itself, out of which my creation was made. Now, is that not also unfair? Am I to be judged by the quality of coat hangers that are used by the dry cleaning establishment that returns our garments? Is not that responsibility of my parents? Should they not share my C? Thank you, Mrs. Othmar. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. 
All right, so let's examine this first monologue. Just like our first exercise, I'll give you a moment to write. You can pause the video and then I'll share my thoughts. So the great thing about theater is that there is no wrong answer. As an audience member of a play or even an audience member listening to this monologue, you might get something completely different out of it than I get out of it. And that's okay. We all bring our life experiences into uh, reviewing a piece of art. So let's jump into this first question. What is Sally's need to tell? What is inspiring her to speak now? So Sally's heard some bad news from her teacher and she's upset because she thinks she deserves a better grade. Though I get the sense that she doesn't really deserve it. She seems pretty manipulative. Maybe Sally has tried some of these tactics on her teacher before and it's worked. So she thinks by confronting her teacher, she can reliably raise her grade. Next question. What does Sally want and who is she talking to? So Sally wants her teacher to raise her grade, whether she deserves it or not. She uses tactics or strategies to get what she wants. She tries to blame other people in other conditions for her poor work. She even blames her teacher when she asks, are you willing to share my C? The teacher is the appropriate person to talk to about this want or goal. Sally could talk about her poor grade to her friends or her family, but that would just be complaining. They can't get her a better grade. She talks to the person in charge. It's the teacher who has the ability to get what Sally wants. Finally, last question about this monologue. What is standing in Sally's way? What obstacles does Sally face to getting her grade raised? So to me, it sounds like Sally might not be the best student. Some of the things she, things she says also leads me to believe that Sally often complains about grades to her teacher and she's having to use wilder and wilder tactics to get her teacher to agree to change her grade. She doesn't use the normal, my dog ate my homework excuse. She's gotta put blame on other people in, in kind of crazy fashion because it sounds like her teacher's kind of wise to her tricks. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed that monologue and discovered the need to tell what the character wants and the obstacles standing in their way. So one of my favorite things about the two monologues that we're gonna look at is that you get a really strong sense of who these characters are. In Sally's monologue, it's really clear that she's very confident She's pretty manipulative and she's working really hard to get what we want. So we can assume it's important to her. We don't have to understand Sally's whole life story to understand what she wants at this one time and how she's trying to get it. So let's look at our next monologue. This one is from Charlie Brown. Again, listen for need to tell what the character wants and how they're going to get it. Again, I'm reading, so please excuse a poor performance. There's that cute little redhead girl eating lunch over there. I wonder what she would do if I went over and asked her if I could sit and have lunch with her. She'd probably laugh right in my face. It's hard on a face when it gets laughed in. There's an empty place next to her on the bench. There's no reason why I couldn't just go over and sit there. All I'd have to do is stand up. I'm standing up. I'm sitting down. I'm a coward. I'm so much of a coward. She wouldn't even think of looking at me. She hardly ever does look at me. In fact, I can't remember her ever looking at me. Why should she look at me? Is there, easy, any, is there any reason in the world why she shouldn't look at me? Is she so great and I'm so small that she can't spare one little moment <gasps> She's looking at me. She's looking at me. He puts a lunch bag over his head. Lunchtime is among the worst times of day for me. If that little red-headed girl is looking at me with this stupid bag over my head, she must think I'm the biggest fool alive. But 
if she isn't looking at me, then maybe I could take it off quickly and she'd never notice it. On the other hand, I can't tell if she's looking until I take it off. Then again, I'm, if I never take it off, I'll never have to know if she was looking or not. On the other hand, it's very hard to breathe in here. He removes the sack. Whew, she's not looking at me. I wonder why she never looks at me. Oh well, another lunch hour over with only 2,863 to go. So let's jump into Charlie's monologue. First off, what is Charlie's need to tell? Why is he speaking right now? So Charlie Brown spots the little redheaded girl at lunch and that sets the monologue in action. It's pretty clear that he already likes the little redheaded girl. This isn't love at first sight and it's certainly not the first time he's seen her. He's had a crush on her for a while, and he's frustrated with his own inability to talk to her. So your, our next question, what does Charlie want and who is he talking to? Charlie wants to gather his courage so that he can talk to the little redheaded girl. He's talking to himself which we call a soliloquy or a character speaking out loud to themselves. In the real world, people often have like a running monologue in their head where they can express their thoughts and feelings. But on stage, if I need to know what a, what's going on inside a character's head, they've got to speak those feelings out loud. So while a character can be anything, an animal, an object, something undead like a zombie, they have to be able to speak their thoughts out loud on stage in order to be a character. A great thing to note about this monologue is that Charlie's want changes. He starts at the beginning wanting to get her attention, but then when he does get her attention, he freaks out and that's when he puts the bag over his head. By the end of the monologue, he's back to wondering why she won't look at him. I love a monologue where a character changes their mind on what they want in the midst of their monologue. Last question. What is standing in Charlie Brown's way? Charlie Brown has what we call an inner conflict. He's trying to gather his courage to approach the little red-headed girl, but unfortunately, he's not quite able to. We know that it's gotten, it's taken some time for Charlie to even to get to this point in uh, wanting the little girl to look at him. And he's gonna have to keep trying to bolster his own courage and his own self-esteem so he can finally get what he wants. So fantastic work. We've gone through two different monologues, examined the need to tell, the want, and the obstacles that they're facing. These are like the three most important building blocks of a monologue. And we've reached the end of our journey today. So thanks so much for tuning in uh, as we start this journey to looking to write our own monologue. Um, your job between now and our next session, which if you're doing this live, is on Thursday, is to read as many monologues as you can. There are a ton of monologues available online, so look for them. And see if you can assess the character's need to tell, their want, and what's standing in their way. We've looked at two examples today, but there are as many ways to write a monologue as there are monologues in existence. And it's gonna help you as a playwright to have some of those in your back pocket. Your other task before our next workshop is to narrow down what your character wants. Monologues are pretty short. In both of the example monologues we saw, the character wanted pretty much one thing. Sally wanted the teacher to raise her grade from a C. And Charlie, well, he first wanted the girl to gain the courage for the girl to approach him. And then he kind of left that goal, but by the end he was back to it. It shifted, but it remained, it was all about getting that courage to approach the little redheaded girl. So think about what your character wants and try and narrow it down. That's where we'll start next time. 
And if the great spirit, playwriting spirit uh, comes to you between now and then, uh, feel free to write a monologue. You can still participate in next workshop. We're gonna keep working on a monologue, so if you've already got one, no problem. Uh, we're gonna continue our process on Thursday. So, our next class can be found at asf.net slash workshops. It's gonna be posted live Thursday, April 23rd at 1 p.m. But of course it's recorded so you can access it at the time that works for you. We'll delve deeper into playwriting. We're gonna look at some more advanced questions. We'll write our monologue and then we'll look at a revision process. So thanks for coming out today. Again, this is Betsy Huggins with Alabama Shakespeare Festival. Visit us online at asf.net slash workshops and I'll see you soon.